Okay, welcome to this, the third in our negligence video. We're going to be focusing on damage caused, so the third element of negligence in the past videos. We've looked at duty of care, breach of duty. We're now going to consider the damage caused and the rules surrounding this. So as mentioned, we've done duty of care in the previous video. Once the duty of care is established, we need to consider was there a breach of that duty. But of course, there would be no negligence unless there is some damage caused as a result. So this video is going to focus on how you prove causation or the damage caused. So the objectives of this video, we're going to be able to define factual causation, we're going to be able to define legal causation, and of course the outcome for that for you is to be able to apply the test to problem questions for both of these. Now both are necessary for a claim in negligence. So you may see this done in different ways, um, in terms of factual causation and the elements which can alter that, and legal causation, and the same there. But I've settled on this structure, I think it, it works for most students, so we're going to go ahead and do this. If you do this in a different way, that's okay, so long as you consider all of these elements. So what we're going to start with is factual causation. Now factual causation, what we need to consider there is the test to establish factual causation first. What happens if there are multiple causes and what is the effect of us and novus actus intervening or intervening act? So factual causation then involves showing the link between the defendant's act or omission and the injury or loss caused. Now not all factual causation involves legal causation, so they are separate but both are necessary for a claim in negligence. Now the claimant must show it's more likely than not if the defendant has not been negligent, his injuries or damage would not have occurred. So essentially this is the but for test, which we're going to focus on now. So the but for test. So what we're saying with the but for test is, but for the defendant's acts or omissions, would the outcome have occurred? So would the harm have occurred, be that physical, mental, financial, what have you? Uh, so in the injury, uh, if the injury would probably have happened even without the negligence, then the claimant will f the claim will fail. So we ask before the defendant's negligence, would the injury or damage have occurred? So a really good example of this is Barnett and Chelsea and Kensington Hospital Management Committee. Uh, the three men in this case have been vomiting for three hours after drinking some tea. They were night watchmen. Uh, the nurse reported their complaints by phone to the duty medical casualty officer who told her to tell them to go home to bed and call their own doctors if they still fell till in the morning. Now the casualty officer did not speak to the men or offer to examine them which would have been normal practice. Now five hours later one of them died from arsenic poisoning. Now the medical opinion was that the claimant was likely to have died from the poisoning even if he'd been admitted to hospital uh, and treated for those five hours. It wasn't common practice to check for arsenic poisoning, so they would have died anyway. So therefore, factual causation was not established as he would have died even without the acts or omissions of the defendant. So a case which demonstrates there is a duty of care to the hospital from the hospital to the patients. It was breached by not checking them properly, but the damage was not their cause. And so we need all elements for a successful claim in negligence. So once we've established the buffer test, we use Barnet to support any application. We then need to consider the effect of multiple causes. So sometimes there may be more than one cause of the injury or damage, but where there are several possible causes of the injury, the claimant must show that the defendant's negligent action is more likely to be the cause than all of the others put together. That's the ordinary rule. Now, if the defendant's breach was just one of a number of possible causes, the claimant must show that it was more likely to be the true cause than the others. So again, best explained through case law. In this case, we have Fairchild and Glenhaven Funeral Services. Now, a worker in this case had contracted mesothelioma, which is a form of cancer caused by exposure to asbestos dust. Now, it was held he could sue any of his previous employers following multiple exposures to asbestos caused by the employer's negligence, even though the claimant could not prove which particular exposure had been the cause of the disease. Now, just one fibre from asbestos can cause this disease, but not every fibre inhaled will do so. So all of the possible exposures to asbestos could have triggered the cancer, and if any and all of the employers were not held to be the cause of the disease, the claimant would not succeed. So. It was therefore unjust on policy grounds to leave this type of claimant without a remedy in law. So this normal rule was adapted slightly to uh, whether it a number of possible causes, the claimant must prove the defendant's breach of duty caused the harm or was a material contribution. 
So in this particular case, any of them could have been liable. So the one sued was liable. Now in Wilshire and Essex, uh, the claimant here was born three minutes prematurely and suffered from a variety of problems associated with being born too early. Now he was put on the oxygen supply and as a result of the doc doctor's admitted negligence, was twice given too much oxygen. Now he eventually suffered permanent blindness and the hospital was sued. However, medical evidence suggested that all of the overdoses of oxygen could have caused the blindness. It could have been also caused by any of the five separate medical conditions which he suffered from. So the House of Lords held that the claimant had to, had to prove, on the balance of probabilities, that the defendant's breach of duty was a material cause of the injury. And it was not enough here to prove that the defendant increased the risk that, of the, da that the damage might occur, uh, or had added another possible cause of it. So the defendant's negligence was only one of several possible causes, and this was not sufficient to prove causation. It couldn't be proven that the defendant was the cause of the blindness. So they are the rules when considering multiple causes then. Uh, now we're going to consider what happens if something happens in between the defendant's negligent act or omission and the eventual consequence. So that's what we call an intervening act. So this is known as novus actus intervenient in Latin. Now it's just a new act, something which happens between the negligent act or omission and the eventual harm, and it can potentially break the chain of causation. This means that the defendant will no longer be liable for the extent of the injuries. So even though a defendant could be identified as negligent and above four tests satisfied in some sentences, so of course it's easy if this person hadn't done what he did, would the outcome have occurred? But that's not our only test. If something happens in the interim, that other person can remove liability or the other act can remove liability. And what this means is that chain of causation or liability can be broken by a subsequent intervening act. Now, if the court accepts that this intervening act is the true cause of the damage suffered, then the defendant may not be liable despite his breach of duty and the duty of care owed. Such a plea by the defendant is known as a new act intervenes or novus actus interveniens and is an effective defence. Now, if the intervening act is not accepted by the court as being the true cause of the damage, then the chain is unbroken and the defendant remains liable. So from the case law, uh, there's no sort of structure apart from academic debate discussion. It seems to be that there are three broad categories of intervening act. So it could be an intervening act of the claimant. So the claimant does something which removes liability potentially. It could be an intervening act of nature. So for example, a storm, if you, you know, you're driving a car, there's a negligent act and uh, you were crash, but also the damage is made worse because a, a, a lightning strike at a tree and that hit your car, of course, that's an intervening act of nature. Or an intervening act of a third party. You know, this is mostly going to be the case, of course, like, for example, medical negligence. So, if we look to case law again, so we've got Reeves and NPC. We knew there was a duty from the duty video because, of course, uh, the person in this case, the victim, was a suicide risk. The prisoner uh, was a suicide risk and the prison knew this. Now, while the police accepted they owed the claimant a duty of care, they argued that the new intervening act was done by the claimant himself, i.e. killing himself. So the court rejected the arguments as the suicide was a specific act that the police should have been seeking to prevent. So there was no new and intervening act. It was a foreseeable act, and this indeed was not an intervening act from the claimant necessarily, which could break the chain of causation. If we look at Karsloggy steamship and the Royal Norwegian government, in this case, the claimant ship was damaged following a collision with a vessel of the defendant's navy and through the defendant's fault. Now, after a delay for repairs to make it seaworthy, the ship then embarked on a voyage it would not have otherwise taken across the Atlantic for more permanent repairs. Now, on that voyage, it suffered further damage in a heavy storm and spent 51 days in the dry dock instead of the 10 days originally estimated. Obviously, then there were financial losses as a result. And the argument here that the defendant should be liable for the damage failed because the storm was a genuine break in the chain of causation. So if it was an ordinary journey, for example, and it damaged because of the original damage, if that just got worse in the journey, that would have been they would have been liable for that, but clearly not the extent because the storm broke that chain of causation. In Knightley and Jones, the defendant uh, through a negligent driving uh, crashed and blocked the tunnel. Now there's no question that this person was a fault for causing the incident here. However, what we're looking at is new and intervening acts. Now in this case, the police officer in charge of the scene 
then negligently sent a police officer against the flow of traffic to block off the tunnel at the other end. Now the problem with this one, then the policeman was then injured who, who was driving to block off the tunnel and he tried to sue the original claimant but it was held that the other police officer telling him to go to the other side of the tunnel uh, was an intervening act and therefore there was no liability to the police officer who was injured from the original defendant. If we look at Smith and Littlewoods, the defendant purchased the cinema here and planned to demolish it. They closed it down and employed contractors to investigate or do preliminary work on the site. Now the cinema was left empty and unattended but locked. And vandals started the fire in the cinema which seriously damaged two adjoining properties, one of which had been demolished. Now it was held a reasonable person in the position of the defendant would not foresee that if he took no action to keep the premises fully secured in a short time before demolition that they would be set on fire and this would result in damage to neighbouring properties. Now the defendant had not known of vandalism in the area or of previous attempts to start fires so the events that occurred were not reasonably foreseeable and therefore this act, the vandalism, did break the chain of causation in terms of any negligence. Okay, so once we've established factual causation, ordinarily, the before test, okay, so if the defendant had not done what he did, would the outcome have occurred? If the answer, it would have happened anyway, then there's no factual causation that we can stop our application there. But if there is, then we need to consider where there are multiple causes and was there a new and intervening act. Now, of course, these second two bullet points won't always be applicable, so we need to be careful in what we select and apply and explain. But if the factual causation is established, we then need to consider legal causation. Now in essence, this is the idea of remoteness of damage. And we're going to look at the Wagon Mountain because that was one of our key cases. It was a persuasive precedent from Australia. But of course, we've got the idea that if damage is too remote and too unlikely, then it's quite possible we shouldn't be liable for it in any negligence claim. So what we're going to do is consider the starting point. Then we're going to consider the type of loss foreseeable and the rules therein and this concept of a thin skull or eggshell skull rule. So legal causation that refers to when the defendant is legally responsible for the injury or loss. So for instance, a defendant should be liable for an injury. It must be shown that the reasonable person could foresee the injury occurring. Now the negligent defendant is liable for all the foreseeable consequences of his actions as illustrated in Palimis, the key case there, but not for damage of a kind that could not reasonably have been foreseen. So the sort of rule here is, if some physical harm is visible or foreseeable, then of course we're going to be liable. But if it's sort of property damage which is unknown, then we're not going to. But again, what we're going to do is cover this with case law. So we start with the key case of the Wagon Mount named after the ship. Uh, now, in this case, the defendant spilt oil while refueling another ship. Now, the oil spread over the water to the claimant's wharf, and the claimant was carrying out repair work to a ship using a welder. Now, the molten metal from the welding fell onto the floating cotton waste, which smouldered and then ignited the oil in the water. Now, the claimant's wharf was severely damaged by the fire. Now, the defendant didn't know and could not reasonably be expected to know that the oil could be set alight when it spread on water. So they'd made inquiries about the possibility of fire as soon as the oil was noticed and suspended welding while the situation was checked. They were told it was safe to continue and took precautions to stop flammable waste falling into the water. Despite this, a fire started and destroyed the wharf. Now damage caused by the oil was foreseeable, so any you know, the slick oil, if it attaches to the wharf, it could maybe rot or what have you, that's fine. But damage by the fire was too remote, and this wasn't foreseeable. So this set out this idea of remoteness and damage test. So following this, this was persuasive precedent. What we've got now is the idea if it's too unforeseeable or too remote, the defendant will not be liable for it. So in the case of Crossland Rawlinson, the claimant was running towards a burning vehicle with a fire extinguisher uh, to put the fire out that the defendant had started. The claimant tripped, fell and was injured. That was held in this case that the injury was too remote. So once we've established if the injury is foreseeable, then they'll be liable. But if it's not, they won't. We need to consider was the type of loss foreseeable.
So the exact type does not need to be foreseeable. So as long as it's within the broad range of consequences, then that's going to be foreseeable. So the defender will be liable if the type of injury is foreseeable, even if the precise way in which it happened was not. So again, we're going to look for Hughes and Lord Advocate to illustrate that. And the defender will also be liable if the broad type of injury was foreseeable, but the extent of the injury wasn't foreseeable. So those are two key rules, and they're slightly different in the approach. Now, in Page and Smith, the claimant was involved in the collision with the defendant whilst both were driving, but the claimant suffered no physical injuries as a result of the crash, but several hours later, he felt exhausted and the exhaustion not abated. Now, for a number of years prior to the accident, the claimant suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome, and the symptoms of which manifested sporadically. Now, the claimant brought an action claiming damages for personal injury caused by the negligence, and that as a result of the collision, his condition had become both chronic and permanent, making it unlikely that he'd be able to pursue full-time employment in the future. Now, the defendant was found liable, and the court appeal allowed his appeal on the ground that the claimant's injury was not reasonably foreseeable, and leave was given to remit the case to the House of Lords. Now, when it got to the House of Lords, uh, the House of Lords were called upon to resolve this issue. Now, when it, there was, the claim was, in a claim brought by negligence for psychiatric injury caused by the defendant, was it necessary that this particular type of harm was foreseeable? And the House of Lords found in favour of the claimant and said that this, if some physical injury is foreseeable, then some mental injury which is linked is also foreseeable, or some other form is foreseeable. And so therefore, we have this idea that it could be extended, so it doesn't matter the extent, so long as some injury was foreseeable. In Bradford and Robertson Rentals, the claimant was required by an employer to take an old van from Exeter to Bedford and collect a new one. Now, the weather was very cold, and there was advice not to travel unless it was necessary, and the vans had no heater, and the windscreen, windscreen kept freezing over. So Bradford, the claimant, had to drive with the window open. Now, the old van's radiator leaked and had to be topped up regularly, and he suffered frostbite as a result. Now, what is here is it's foreseeable that he would suffer some cold-related injury, so the defenders were liable for his frostbite, even though it was very unusual. Now, the reason for the claimant succeeding is that frostbite is merely an extreme form of injury being from cold. Now, this next case looks at um, the concept of if an injury is foreseeable, the way it happened doesn't really matter as long as some injury was foreseeable. So, in Hughes and Lord Advocate, post office man, uh, workmen left a manhole unattended, covered by a tent and paraffin lamps by the hole. Now, the claimant in this case was an eight-year-old boy and a friend, in fact, it was his uh, nephew, his ten-year-old nephew, uh, climbed into the hole. Now, on the way out, the boys knocked one of the paraffin lamps into the hole. This caused an explosion which badly burned the claimant. Now, the boy was able to claim for his injuries since it was foreseeable that a child might explore the site and break a lamp be burnt or even just for some physical injury. So, if some physical injury is foreseeable, then even though the explosion itself wasn't, uh, some harm is liable, so the, it doesn't matter the way it happened, and so the defendants were liable. In Jolly and London Sutton Borough Council, a 14-year-old boy was playing on an abandoned boat. In fact, he jacked it up and tried to tinker with it. The council knew it was in a dangerous condition, and the children were likely to play in it. So the, boy, the boat fell on a boy, and he was paralysed. The court ruled that it was reasonably foreseeable for children to play in the boat and get injured, so the council did owe a duty of care. Indeed, the breach of duty as some injury was foreseeable, even if the exact injury wasn't. In Doherty and Turner Manufacturing, the clay material was burned when an asbestos lid was knocked into a vat of molten metal. The lid slid into the liquid with no noticeable effect for a few minutes. Now, a chemical reaction had caused a violent eruption. The scientific knowledge at the time didn't expect to happen. Now, it could be foreseen that knocking things into the liquid might cause a splash of molten metal, but this explosion was a wholly different type of injury uh, which could have, or an event which could have been foreseen. Therefore, it was not likely that some injury in this way was going to happen or the extent of injury was going to happen, and the claim was unsuccessful. And finally, once we've established the type of loss foreseeable, so what we mean by that is, if some injury is foreseeable, then you're liable for the full extent, even if the way it happened wasn't foreseeable. The final element then is the thin skull or 
eggshell skull rule. What this means is not a literal thing. This is interpreted to mean a vulnerability of the claimant. Now the rule is you take a victim as you find them or the defendant takes a victim as he finds him. So if there's any uh, any sort of vulnerability such as a literal thin skull or pre-existing cancerous condition then the defendant is liable for the full extent. So this means you must take them as you find them. So if the damage is reasonably foreseeable or some damage is reasonably foreseeable but it's much more serious to the because of the individual circumstances such as a thin skull then the defendant is liable for the full extent of the injuries. So in Smith and Leach's brain, a man was burned on the lip by molten metal because of the defendant's negligence. The man had an existing precancerous condition and the burn brought about the onset of full cancer and a man died. Now his widow claimed against the defendants and it was held that as a burn was foreseeable injury, the defendant was liable for the cancer and thus the death as well because in negligence you take your victim as you find them and your pre-existing conditions of the claimant cannot prevent the defendant's liability. In court on IBC vehicles, Mr. Core was employed as a maintenance engineer and was injured whilst carrying out his work caused by malfunctioning machinery. Now following the accident, Mr. Core suffered a severe depression and committed suicide. Now Mr. Core had never suffered from psychological illness before the accident, but here the chain of causation was not broken as it was found the defendant had been negligent. Again, it doesn't matter if the condition only appeared because of the injury, but clearly this person was more susceptible even if they hadn't had the injury before. And in a nutshell, that's it. So what we do, of course, is go through each of those elements. Um, and we've considered in this video damage caused. Now, I hope this is useful. Uh, you should obviously do factual causation and then go into legal causation and think of all of those issues. But th there is a separate video on how to apply the law on negligence, should you wish to watch that instead. That will help you. Okay, thank you for watching.